I imagine you won't let me forget to give you your exams. Um, but we'll do that once everyone gets here. I wanted to go over, uh, so the homeworks are back, right? they've been graded, the um, solutions are up, as is the quiz for Monday is also up. Okay. One of the homeworks I wanted to go over, I will admit that I looked at the homework, I mean, that I gave you on this problem. So this is the problem with the bump in the solving blackjack, right? This was, let me label these. So this was using important sampling, and I think one of them was the weighted. Important sampling. And the orange one was ordinary important sampling, right? And it was looking at the mean squared error on number of episodes. And it was actually averaged, I think, over 10 runs on each of these. And the ordinary important sampling, this isn't, I think this ordinary important sampling was a lot more squiggly, as I remember. Uh, but this gives the general uh, idea of it, was why the heck in weighted important sampling did it seem to go up and then go down? And so I thought about it for a brief amount of time after I signed it. I said, I don't really know. And then someone posted on Piazza a question, like last Thursday, they were getting a uh, starting early on their assignment, and I still didn't really know. And I thought, well, I bet if I look at the solutions, right, that I'll get some good idea that I can then write up the solution. And nothing really spoke to me, right? We t there were people talking about the fact that variance in weighted importance sampling is smaller than in ordinary importance sampling, and that the bias starts out um, right, because it's it is biased, and over time, as you increase the number of episodes, it approaches the right amount, and that's all true. But it didn't explain why there's a bump. Okay. So last night after grading, perhaps I'm giving out a little more information than I should about how this actually works. But sometimes that's what happens. You don't know the answer. So I decided I needed to figure it out, and so I went ahead and basically created some code that would generate this chart. So I could actually look and see what the heck is going on. And I was surprised at what it is. But let me give you an example episode. All right? And then we can try and figure it out from there. So an, an example episode where the mean squared error went up, right? And the mean squared error is just the error, the difference between the estimate and the true value. So. Estimate minus true value squared. True value was obtained by some other method. Right? I think uh, dynamic program, in fact, as, as I remember. Okay, so we got a true value equals negative, I think it was negative 0.2 something. Okay, so that is with the policy that they were looking at, which I believe was to hold on 20 or 21. By the way, I, I always recommend holding on 21. Um, and then hitting every other time. And this is if you start with a 12. And I don't remember what the dealer had. But in any case, your value was uh, negative. So I looked at the episodes. And I found an episode where it went up. All right, so if we look, for instance, at the estimate, and this was the time step. This is the value of the, the actions 
state pair of being at 20 and a fold of infinity? This is the value of, let's see, dealer was showing a three, maybe. I don't remember what the dealer was showing. So dealer has three, we have 12. And the policy is hit stick on 20 or 21. Okay, so that's, that's what we're evaluating, that particular state. And so what happened is, The mean squared error at time step one was, the estimate was zero, so it's about 0 0.2, 0 0.2 squared, so it was about 0.4. And then at time two, it was <coughs> negative one, so difference is 0 0.8, so 0 0.8 squared is what, 0 0.6, something like that. And then it went down. Okay, so it went up, then it went down. So we got ourselves a blip. Here's the reason. This estimate of zero. Okay. We always start with an estimate of zero if our behavioral policy and our pi policy don't match. That is, if pi uh, over b equals zero, then we just say it's zero in the weighted importance sampling. Okay, if that's the case. So basically, when you start out, your estimate is zero. And then, if you take a behavior that your policy wouldn't do, then your estimate is still zero. Okay. So what would it mean in our case to take a behavior? So the behavior, po the behavior policy was just randomly hit or stick. So what would it mean that in our first episode, our ratio is zero? Daniel. The probability for the policy that we are trying to analyze is zero. Yeah. So what would that mean? What happened? What did the behavior do? We started out at 12, and what did the behavior do? What's one possibility of what it did? that is not in alignment with what our, policy, what our, what our um, target policy is, right? So we have our, our behavior policy is random. And our target policy is stick on 20 or 21 and hold otherwise. So we're starting at 12. What might our behavior policy have done that our target policy says, no, I would never do that? Stick. Stick. So you get a 12 and you stick. OK? So if that's the case, then our ratio is 0. And if our ratio is 0, then we say, OK, I don't have any things to wait. I'm going to just say our value is 0. And if the value is 0, we know the mean squared error is 0.4. Okay? The next episode, what happened? We have an estimate of negative 1. Estimate of negative one means we lost this hand. Okay? But if we have an estimate of negative one, that means we must have a non-zero ratio. So this is non-zero. Okay. So we actually did something like our estimate equals the ratio times negative one 
over the ratio. And we got an estimate of negative 1. So why are there two ratios? Because this is the weighted so this important sampling. Ratio over the so this is the ratio times negative 1 over the ratio. Gotcha. Right. We do a sum of ratios, right? So we do a sum of ratio times a total reward over the sum of the ratios. So here, we here we only have one. This is why we say it's biased, mm -hmm. because our estimate is just whatever the behavior policy is. Okay. So now we get a negative one, which is worse than our zero. We're farther away from our estimate because zero was a special case. Okay. And if we now go through and maybe get a zero here, how could we get a zero here? Let's say that this ratio was 1 8. Okay? Which meant basically the behavior policy took three random actions that are in alignment with our policy. So it took three random actions and then we lost. How do we know they lost? Because we got a minus one. Okay? So this would be 1 8 over 1 8. This is estimate two, right? After our second policy, after our second uh, uh, episode. Our estimate three stays the same, stays the same, stays the same. Maybe we just had a bunch of episodes with zero ratio, right? So we have zero, 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 and then we get down to here. Okay, so we got a total of zero. How, and we have to kind of back our way into this. How did we get a zero? We know we've got one eighth times negative one plus something times something over one eighth plus that something. Right? We've got a total reward and we've got a ratio. What must it be? What are our possible total rewards, Justin, that we can get from the blackjack game? You can either get one, zero, or negative one. One, zero, negative one. So what must we have gotten? One. One, because we end up at zero, right? So nothing else is going to. So if we were one there, now what must our ratio be if we're ending up at zero? We're ending up at zero, our ratio. I'll help you out. If we're ending up at zero, our numerator better be zero. Yeah. And therefore, this had better be. Or that better be uh, one eighth. Yeah, one eighth. That makes sense. Yeah. Why is the ratio one eighth and not eight? Like, if the ratio is pi over b, we're saying so pi would be one, and b would be one half. And only two yeah. Five. Excellent. Excellent. Excellent point. This is the. Uh, Inverse of the ratio, because <laughs> I got it wrong. Yes. So fix all these to be 8, because as you point out, it's pi over b. We know the b's are uh, 1 halves, because it's equal probable, and the pi is just 1. So much better. Thank you. So now we get a zero. We know if we get a zero, our mean squared error is back down to 0.4. Right? So that's what happened. I was totally surprised. I just didn't realize this is all coming about, basically from the fact that until we get a valid ratio, we're going to just set this, specify that the value is zero. And so that's why we get the blip, because zero happens to be pretty good in this problem. There might be many problems for which zero would be completely far away from the actual value. But here, zero is fairly close. So we have a low error. So by the time you get up to about 10, you're pretty likely to have gotten at least one non-zero ratio and then gone back down to get another non-zero ratio. Right? So the first one is your up part. The second one's down. And it goes all the way over to 10, because you might have as many as 10 um, uh, 
10 episodes where you don't match. But it's unlikely that you're going to get much more than that. Yeah. So if you were not to account for the zero, if you like remove the zeros from your thing, then like from your weighted whatever it was, your average, then you wouldn't get the split. And would that be useful for the zeros? So when we say remove zeros, there's two ways to look at it. Is this a zero because we have a zero? Because there's, you can get a zero from a zero ratio, from a zero reward, or from your total being zero. All three of these different ways, right? In our problem, we do have a possibility of a zero reward. We've also seen a zero ratio. And here, we see that the weighted sum is zero, too. So when you say remove zeros, which of those three? Uh, are you? Zero ratio. OK, so the zero ratio. You might do that. What you could do is just say, we're not even reporting. We don't even have an estimate if we've never seen anything. We just don't know. In which case, you're, you would somehow just not report any estimate here and then make your uh, chart, let's say, when you were taking the averages, just say, I'm, I'm throwing out the ones that don't have any numbers there. And then you would no longer have a blip. Right? So. Yeah. So in that chart was. Uh, plotting the individual estimate from each episode along those episodes, or isn't it aggregated? So I guess what my point of confusion is that if we're looking at each time we do a new episode, we, the way that we consider our estimate is by looking at this weighted important sampling, then the, the, the terms with the ratio of zero effectively aren't there. In the numerator, they'll be zeroed out, and in the, it's like zero times whatever the actual reward was, and then the denominator is just zero again. So once we've gotten a non-zero ratio, then any future zero ratios just don't matter, as you point out, because we've got a zero on the top and a zero on the bottom. The problem is, until we've gotten one, we've got a problem with our formula, because that would give us a, a, a denominator of zero. Okay. Right. And so therefore, the rule is just, if you have uh, if you don't have any non-zero ratios, just treat the whole thing as zero. Treat that whole fraction, that whole you know sum of this over this. Just treat it as zero. So, um, so is this different than when we were walking backwards in our episode and then we stop once we got something that wouldn't happen and we like don't even consider it? Or is that something? That is, so this is the case where we're doing off policy, right? right? And there, when you're walking back, that is, uh, yeah, that is pretty much identical, actually, in the case that when you're walking back from the last and then you stop, when you get to some place you couldn't have reached yeah. from your policy, you don't look anything further back. That's sort of saying the same thing about we're trying to value a state that we could never, right. you know, given the episodes we have, we can never, we can never assign to. I see. So the, the reason why we don't have that sort of safeguard is because the book was looking at first visit mainly. So it needs like a, I think for this example, it was, because it seems like if it's doing every visit, then we, as soon as we get to the point where this sort of conundrum might arise, where like, we're done with this, then we don't even. It shouldn't matter whether it's first visit or every visit now should well especially because and that was another question right in blackjack unless i had to think carefully about the ace of situation but you can't get back to the same state in a in a given episode right there's no, there's no way to get back so first visit and every visit are effectively the same the problem is we are asking about the value of a state for which we have no we, we have no way of estimating using the soft policy. We just have no estimate, and we're saying we'll call no estimate zero. I don't want to belabor this one too much. Okay. Yeah. There's, sorry, I know we went over this last time, but why, if the ratio of zero doesn't affect the estimate, then why do we allow for uh, to be zero and be non-zero? 
Why do we allow pi to be 0 and b non-zero? When you say allow, what do you mean? Because we can't have b equal 0 and pi non-zero. That's something that we ban when we're doing our policy. Yeah, we do say that the uh, that, uh, policy has the, the behavior policy has to cover the um, target policy. In the sense that any time the target policy is non-zero, the behavior policy has to be non-zero. Um, it's really because, well, when you back up, so first off, we want to be able to deal with greedy policies, right? So we, do we, we don't want our target policy to have to be soft. That is, we want it to be able to have zero for some particular states. And, and what we just say is, this particular episode, if you look at it from top to bottom, as you're moving back, once you reach a non-possible action, then it doesn't even make sense to go beyond that. Uh, who still needs one? Does everyone else have one? All right, so here's the deal. Um, take a look at the bottom of every page and make sure that you've got pages two through eight. Just sort of look at the bottom and not all the rest of the page. Take a look at the front. Make sure you don't have any questions right now. One thing I want to make. Good thing. Uh, how much time do you expect this exactly? It is hard to say. <laughs> I went through and did it, and admittedly, I wrote. I, I created the exam, so I, I know it fairly well. But I did it from scratch in 15 minutes. Okay. <laughs> so, but I don't expect you guys to do it in 15 minutes. But my hope is that you are not time constrained. My intent was not to make this time constrained. Um, and don't. It won't. It will take you for sure more than 15 minutes. Um, you know, um, part of the reason I ask, I ask how many minutes, right, is not to, it's not a double check on you. The reason is so that I can calibrate the exam and, and, and for future adjust things, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, don't write on the back of the exam, right? I scan these in and it gets all confusing if I've got stuff on the back pages. So if you need more space, add more blank pages and just staple them to the end. And like not writing an exam, don't even write doodles and stuff like that. Because again, the scanning gets confusing. Do you mind if we turn it into your office? I do not mind if you turn it into my office. Cool. So yeah, that'd be fine. <laughs> so um, I think that's about it. Okay. Do make sure you go over the homework solutions. I'd recommend not only, of course, for this last homework, but also for previous homeworks as well. Sometimes you get the tendency to say, well, it, one might. I certainly would. Well, I got full marks on the homework. Well, of course you did, because it was just an attempt. <laughs> um, and so it's worth looking at the solution. Garrett. Uh, what is the last material we covered in the class that will be beyond? The last material is Monte Carlo. All right, so let's go back and into talking about temporal difference learning. Again, the distinction between Monte Carlo and temporal difference is Monte Carlo says, wait till you get to the end of your episode and use that reward or the intermediate rewards to go ahead and update your states or state action pairs. 
Temporal difference learning says every time I take an action and get a reward, I get two things when I take an action. I get a reward and I get a state, both of which are in some sense surprising. Right? They're a sample from some distribution that I don't know about. Right? The environment provides me a reward and provides me a new state, probabilistically. And so this gives me a sample, and this allows me to update what's going on. The book has, and I kind of like it, a idea of, let's say, you are commuting home. How many seniors here? All right, so let's say, how many of you have jobs for next year? All right, so you'll all be commuting next year. I recommend you have a very close commute, okay? Take, set up your uh, residence so that you don't have a long commute. In any case, you're commuting, okay? We'll pretend we're doing this next year. You're commuting home, and you have an estimate of how long it's going to take. In fact, you have an estimate for all the little parts of your commute, right? You have your, let's say we're commuting from here to where would we commute to? We're going to go to, uh, we're going to go take the train to LA and then uh, walk to some restaurant there, let's say. Okay, so we're going to walk. We've got some different components of this. Okay, so we're going to walk to the bus stop. We're going to take the bus to the train station. <laughs> we're going to take the train to LA, Union Station. And then we're going to uh, take an Uber to the restaurant. All right, how long is this going to take? Oh, and there's a few more things about this. We walk to the bus stop. We wait. We wait. We wait. Why do we wait? Why don't we have like no waiting time? Why don't we just say we're going to walk to the bus stop and just as we arrive, the bus comes and we just keep stepping and walk up onto this bus. If we time right, if we time right, we could do it. But not necessarily. Like, what if the bus schedule doesn't coincide with that? You know, like, like. Well, I guess somewhere you might have to have. Maybe it's before we have a wait. Right. We could wait before we start walking, right? So if the bus is coming in 30 minutes and it's right out there on Foothill, uh, unless we walk really slowly, we get the problem you come up with. It's like you get there, the bus isn't there. We didn't think it was going to be there. Okay, but if we think it's going to be there at 11.22 and we start walking and we get there, do we want to plan on getting there at 11.22? It's not how interacting with the bus system Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> that. Yes. And you don't want to do that with a train either, unless you're in Germany or Switzerland where the, you know, they run on time. <laughs> so let's just put in some estimates here of how long we think it's going to take. So our estimate of walking to the bus stop. It's just out on Foothill, three minutes, let's say. And our wait, I would suggest we wait at least, right? We ar ar arrange it so that we're there three minutes earlier. So we have a three minute wait. And then we have the bus to the train station, which takes 10 minutes. And you know what? I'm actually going to, for the sake of argument, remove the weights. And here's why. I don't, those are like slack time, and I don't, I don't want to do that. I just want to have one, one thing finishes, the next thing starts. So 10 minutes, the train to Union Station is going to be uh, what is it? Is it 60 minutes from here, maybe? Yeah. OK. All right. And then our Uber is going to be another, it's 12 minutes. All right. So our total time we would expect is going to be right, 60, 72, 82, 85 minutes. And we can look at here and look at kind of remaining time. Right? Before we start that activity. Now, let's look at a Monte Carlo approach to this. So these are our estimates right now, based on our experience with having been on the train and the bus and 
someone walking. We actually do this. And we find that our walk to the bus stop um, and ideally we'd be doing this with driving because trains only come every so often. This is the brand new, right? This is the Metrolink of 2030 where they actually come every 30 seconds, right? There's a train. So let's just say that happens, something like that. We don't have to wait for the next one. Um, so we walk to the bus stop, but someone stops to talk to us, right? That we can't get out of. And it actually takes seven minutes. So this is a particular episode. And then we get on the bus to take the bus, and the bus has a flat tire, right? And they have to send a new bus or tire or however they deal with these things, right? And it actually takes uh, 25 minutes, 35 minutes, okay? And then we get on a train, and the train works just fine, and the Uber, like it's peak pricing and there are a lot of people waiting and not very many cars and how many people think it's ethical to have this surge pricing? All right. What does surge pricing promote? But, so we have this supply and demand issue. The surge pricing is up because supply is high in real, no. demand is high in relation to supply. And so what does surge pricing do? Yeah, it does two things. It encourages riders not to ride, and it encourages drivers to drive, both of which are good things, I think. So, you know, if it's rainy or a storm or something like that, you want to encourage more drivers. Anyway, I think it's a good thing. <laughs> you know, anyway, so it takes 20 minutes. So our total is a lot longer than our 85, right? It's 115, 122 minutes. Monte Carlo would say, hey, now we can go through and do some updates to some of these, all right, in terms of remaining time. TD would say, why are we waiting? Once, right, once you determine that it took seven minutes instead of three minutes, could we update what our total remaining time is going to be? Yes. We could say, we used to think that it was 85, and now we'll say it's 89. Right? Isn't that our best estimate of how long it'll take us? Well, sorry. Let's see if we get this right. After the seven minutes has happened, there's 82 to go, we thought. And we would still say there's 82 to go, right? But that the total is going to be 89 and not the 82. Okay. We can update the, uh, our new estimate of remaining time, right? We have some new evidence, and we should probably increase this from 85 to a little more. Once we do this one, we can do the same sort of thing, right? After this one takes us 35 minutes, that 82 is probably too low as our general estimate of how long it takes us. And we can determine that right away. We don't have to wait till the thing is all over. And we could do the same thing if things take us less time than we thought. We can go ahead and update our estimates. Does that concept make sense? And this is true even if these estimates, the subsequent estimates, aren't very good. So let's say this is our value that we're looking to estimate and to update. Let's say <coughs> leave that one there and I'll put some new ones over here. So let's say this one is I don't know. We say wherever we are 
take 13 minutes to get to that restaurant. Okay? Maybe we've never taken the train, never taken the bus, never walked, never taken an Uber. Okay? I don't know. 13 minutes sounds good to me. So this is remainder. We walk. It takes us seven minutes. What can we conclude from that? Is our estimate of 13 minutes good or not? Probably not. Because we got to the bus. How much time do you think it takes? 13 minutes, right, on the bus. But it takes us seven minutes already, so that's more than 13. So we should really update this to 20, or at least something closer to 20. For all the estimates to be 13, are you assuming that it takes 13 minutes to go to the bus and takes zero minutes for everything else? You know, I, all I, all, I, don't, I don't know how this physics stuff works, <laughs> right? And time and space continuum. All I know is I got to come up with some estimates, and I, I decided 13 is a good number, right? <laughs> and then I interacted with the environment. And I saw, OK, I get to the bus stop. I know how long I think it takes from the bus stop. It's 13 minutes. It actually took me seven, so 20 minutes seems more reasonable than 13 for how long it takes from the bus stop. And then, once I actually took the bus, I would go update its estimate based on what really happened, and the train, and so on. And my estimates would be better than they were. So I'm, I'm quite confused. Okay. We originally had the remaining was the amount of time that we thought for the whole thing, minus each of the, like, aggregating each of the our expected times for each of our steps. Right now, if we say that we expect 13 minutes remaining before we go to the bus stop, and also 13 minutes uh, before we go to the train, and so on and so forth, like Daniel was mentioning, then that would be our estimates for each of those times is zero, except for the Uber to the restaurant for us. Here, here, let's look at it this way. Uh -huh. We're in the state of about to walk to the, yes. to the, to the bus. I do the walk. That's my action. And now my reward is, how long did it take? Okay, Because I, I, I don't know anything about how long things take. Right? All I know is I want to estimate how long it's going to take to get to the restaurant. And I have crappy estimates to begin with of how long it's going to take from any, from any point in my state space. And my state space is where I am now, at the bus stop, at the train station, at the Union Station. Those are my possible states. You still have knowledge that these things happen in series. Um, well, that would be another thing we could add in here is I don't, all I know is I'm here and I start walking. And then I look and I open my eyes. And I'm thankful I have not been killed on the way. And oh, I'm at the bus stop. Oh, it took me three minutes. <laughs> now I'm finding some information about my environment. I don't want to try and build that. But basically, that's what TD is. Right? I'm someplace, I take an action, I open my eyes, I say, where am I? And, and what reward happened on the way? And in this case, the reward is just some calculation of how, of how much time. So, the reason why it's clear to me is that what if seven minutes is a perfectly reasonable amount of time for you to have done that walk, and in fact, your estimate already accounted for those seven minutes, so that yeah. um, you will properly, like, you only have six more minutes of your journey, and you have no reason to update that there. Uh, as I iterate, eventually I will find that my estimates for these remainders, the difference will exactly be how long it takes. So, right? Let's go. Let's go through and update this. Let's do it twice. Okay. So let's go. We update this one to twenty because it's the estimate of the state I'm going to next plus the time it took. Now we'll go update this one. It's what do we estimate this as plus the time it took. So this will now be 48. We'll update, let's update this one. What do we estimate it'll be plus the time it took? 73. And finally, we'll update this one. We're in a terminal state, so that's 0 plus 20 is 20. Notice, this is not a very good estimate of how long it's going to take for me to get to downtown, right? But if I do it again, now I say, 
It took me seven minutes, and I'm estimating 48, so that'll be 55. It took me 35 minutes, and I estimated 73, right? So that'll be 108. Correct me if I'm doing this wrong here. 20 plus 60 is 80. Notice at this point, this one and this one are actually correct now, given my experience. And if I do it a little more, all these will finally be correct. So at no point am I actually explicitly figuring out how long does it take to get between these two things. Instead, I'm just saying I'm updating my estimate of that time left based on my experience. So those initial values is reflective of the fact that we don't always have that prior knowledge of what order um, events are going to occur, or states are going to fall in. In this case, we, it's not that we don't know what states are going to fall in. We just don't know what the values are. I've never been on a train. It could be like a teleporter and take zero time. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's like one of the advanced science fiction ones that take negative time. I don't know. You know? I could know the exact states, but I still don't know how long it takes. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Let us look at a maze. And let's say here's the start and here's the end. And we get plus one on this transition. Okay? And we're discount factor point nine, let's say. Which encourages, you know, hurry, hurry along the along the maze. And I want to look at two different cases, Monte Carlo and TD in solving this. So in the Monte Carlo case, we are moving around and we get some sort of an estimate. Okay, so let's actually do the Monte Carlo. Let's say we happen to go Okay, this is looking good. Uh-oh. And this isn't even really showing the fact that we probably went over a state multiple times. We get this episode. Which of these states can we now update? All of the ones we traversed. So we're going to update this guy and 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 this guy. And it'll all be based on the discounted reward, right? So this guy will be a 1, this guy will be a 0.9, and a 0.9 squared, and so on all the way back. So we'll have values for all those. Any questions on that? And then we do the same thing. with TD. So we start, I'm not sure which is the start state. Let's, let's say it's here, okay? And we happen to move to the right. Well, first off, let's look at our estimates. What should we initialize the estimates of all these states to be? Zero. zero. I, I mean, 13 is a pretty good number, but zero is even better, right? So let's say it's, it's zero for all these. So the value of this guy equals zero. And the value of this guy equals zero. When we go from here to here, we now get a chance to update this value. We update the value with the immediate reward we got, which is zero, plus the value of this state discounted. Zero. So this is remains at zero. And as we move all the way through here, we're getting immediate rewards of zeros. And our new state we move to has a zero. And so nothing's changing. Right? So it's zero everywhere. Until we finally get to here. Right? Because we get our golden ticket. We get our one. And now, Garrett, which states update? The top right state updates to point 0.9. This guy updates to point 0.9. And nothing else updates. OK? Does that make sense? Because right, if we look at the update, we are saying q 
of st plus 1, at plus 1, plus equals the reward, let's use t here, at time t plus 1. Yeah. Uh, so, yes. like, Excel, like, updating that all the way from the end, like, oh well, I'm seeing that because, like, in that case, for example, like, the training and, like, um, if we just update the last step and progress backward, that will take us only, like, linear time. Well, in this case, it would take us all the way square. So, you like all the green check marks here. And the fact that we only update this one seems wasteful um, or slow. Well, like, I guess the benefit is like we can do the update like while we are. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Well, well, so we are doing this online updating. Uh -huh. So one advantage is we were updating even if the episode never ended, and the Monte Carlo would just go away in an infinite loop, right? If it never, if it never updated. We are going to talk about how could we somehow get this to update. Really, there are a couple of different approaches. But let's just finish this a second. So, Alfredo, let's finish this. So this is the SARSA update we talked about. So we're saying we're going to update Q. It's um, S of T, A of T. We're going to take the immediate reward. And what else do we want to? The uh, discount factor times the value of the next state. All right, so the next date is t plus 1. And what action? It's basically whatever the next action we take is. <laughs> OK. Minus, so this is our target, right? And our error is the difference between our target and our current value. So our current value, and we will throw a learning rate in there. Okay. So we're not going to move all the way to it. We're going to move towards that target value. That way we're not whipsawed all around. So we went step by step through the maze. And every time we applied this, and we kept just getting zeros and zeros and zeros and zeros and zeros until we finally got to here. And all of a sudden, we got a 1. We know this in the terminal state is guaranteed to be 0. So we get a 1 minus 0, and we now update our value. And actually, you said 0.9, and it's not 0.9, right? It's 1. Because it was our immediate reward. Right. So I fail to see like the advantages of T B over Monte Carlo. Doesn't Monte Carlo converge faster? Not necessarily. And we can combine these in some sense. So we can have don't look back one step, look back multiple steps. We're gonna get into that. And the other thing we can say is, what if we, this generated an episode, right? So we had an episode with, we'll call this 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 19, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So this is state 13, right? So if we look, we started in state 13, and we went right, and we got a zero reward, right? And then we were in state 14, and we went right, zero reward. 15 right, zero reward. 16 up, zero reward. 12 up, zero reward. 8 up, zero reward. 4 up, one reward. Done. Right? With Monte Carlo, it was a different episode. But in any case, we would take this, and we would apply it. If we were smart, we could save this from our TD. As we did our learning, we did it step to step, 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 right? But this is valuable information. 
How is this valuable, this episode record? Um, Daniel. You can sort of, I mean, you could like start, if you uh, do repeated updates, you would kind of achieve a similar effect of what Monte Carlo is doing. Yeah, this, really the, the, what's the information here that's, that we glean from this? Um, what states we to other states? Yeah, okay, so we, we know if we're in 13 and we do a write that one sample tells us we get zero award and we're in 14. So we're getting some information about the environment. So I'm seeing that like, like saving the episode record gives us this sort of total return. But uh, for, I'm not even going to say total return. I'm going to say saving our history. What if we just, what if we did this? We, we, we run our maze, we do our thing, right? We go through, we get our reward, and then we think about it. And in our minds, we say, what if I just went back and kind of replayed that? Okay? If I replay this in my mind after having updated this to one, we replay and we say, if I go from 13 and go right, I could get a zero and be in 14. What if I update it now in my mind? Right? I don't actually interact with the environment. I just use some past experience. I could update this. I could say it's our, my reward of zero plus whatever the state is worth of 14. Well, unfortunately, those are still zeros. And I get zero, and I get zero, and I get zero, and I get zero. But this one, when I'm in four, no, in eight, I say, well, if I do an eight and I go up, I get my immediate reward of zero plus whatever the discounted for this state. At the time I ran it, my estimate of the discounted value of state four was zero. But I've got new information now, right? I now know my estimate of this is one. So I'm going to update this to be 0.9. Okay. Isn't that the same as Monte Carlo? That's just like back propagating your final reward to get your total. Okay. My, my previous question is more so to further like what the state of the data was mentioning. No. Was uh -huh. higher than that. Our issue with Monte Carlo is that we have to finish an episode. We have to finish an episode, and yes. And it seems like there's still no guarantee that we'll finish an episode. You know, we could just get stuck in the loop. In, in the with TD? Days, with TD. Yeah, that's right. So, so let's, let's, let's say don't save the whole episode. Let's just save things we've done. OK? I don't have to have the, the episode ending here necessarily. I can just save the fact that I've gone through this experience. This is something we're looking at much later on down the road when you talk about planning. But it's just something to consider when you're interacting with your environment. Why throw that information away? Because that's valuable information. Just save it in a replay buffer and go replay it at your leisure. It doesn't matter whether it's a complete episode or not. It doesn't matter whether it terminated or not. You can still look at what are these um, transitions, and how can I get up at my state? So if I go through and replay this again, now all of a sudden, I know from going from here up to here, this might be good as a 0.81, right? I'm not actually inter interacting with my environment. I'm saving my interactions with my environment. So I can go through and actually update all these if I want. Okay. So one interaction with my environment, and replay it a lot. There are a variety of different ways to get this. One way is this one step TD and replay your actions. Another way is explicitly look back, not just one step, but two steps or three steps or K steps. So that it's a, it's a sliding scale between TD, which is one step, and Monte Carlo, which is N steps where it is the length of the episode. We can make it whatever we want in there. This, again, is looking ahead. Because right now, we're really just talking about the one-step TD. So one Jay. question I had was uh, in the earlier example, we didn't, so, uh, we didn't subtract the value of like, the current state. Like, we have to hit 20 to uh, 55 instead of like 55 minus the value of the current state. So I'm wondering, why do we do that in, the, in this example? If 
this step size is one, then notice we are adding, right, because of the plus equal here, we're adding QSAT, and then we're subtracting QSAT. So if your step size is one, all you do is just set it to be your reward plus your new state. And so implicitly, our step size was one. It's, it's equal, no plus, and no this. Or it's exactly this with a step size of one. So a step size less than one says, instead of just setting it to 55, update the 20 so it's closer to 55. See ya. So in this case, in this example, when you like- With the maze? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It looks like effectively the same thing would happen when you did TD or Monte Carlo for like one episode, and is the difference, is that because the state started at zero, or is like the value started at like 10 or something like that, then like you would be, I guess maybe you still wouldn't be updating after each um, one? In this case, if all the, the reason we weren't updating is because the states had all the same value, right? right? If they'd had different values, then we would actually be updating them to be equal to one another. You know, as we keep getting zero reward, we're adjusting it so that um, they're the same. But in general, in this particular case, Monte Carlo is going to update all the states it's seen after the episode is over. And TD, in this case, is going to only update this. It will update along the way uselessly and only update the last state for this particular problem. It's not to say Monte Carlo is always better. Why not do the maze backwards? Why not start with some non-zero reward? And then that way you're actually giving your state some real value. You don't have to um, struggle and toil for some indeterminate amount of time until you finally get to a positive reward. Do you remember day one? And we sent you out of the door. And then we had you come back in. I guess we could have set you up like this and started giving you a reward, but it's not very um, realistic in the sense of when you have this reinforcement learning problem, you don't know shit, right? <laughs> You're just in a state. But you don't know the rewards, right? No, I don't know the rewards. I can only interact with the environment to get the rewards. No one tells me this is a maze. No one tells me it's a maze that I need to solve as quickly as I can. All I know is I do shit and I get zero and I get zero and I get zero and eventually I get a clicker, right, for getting at the end. So would, it, would that be a, like a, a strong method versus weak method? Because it feels like most of the problems that we worked on, we still have some knowledge about. Like it's not even, I would say that it's not so much of a stretch that we're like making it so modeled. Like it still kind of feels modeled for you just to start backwards or start at a place where you know that you're going to get a reward from. So. If you wanted to start at a place that has a reward, you're assuming you know something about the environment and where rewards are. So the examples that we've been doing where we also like write the code for the environment, in reality what would happen is that that code is like in some other place. That code might be in the world, uh, right? So for instance, you're a uh, robot trying to pick things off an assembly line and move them from here to here. And so there, um, we will code the reward probably in some way. Um, but like what actually happens when you try and grab and move these sensors and so on and what actually occurs is going to be based on life, you know. One last thing. So uh, in terms of like our, our policy while we do this first maze, kind of like whatever, or is, do we do, are we still following the general idea of like a policy iteration where- We'd probably do an epsilon greedy. Epsilon greedy, okay. So is the advantage of TD, like if we like had one episode where like we got to the end of this, so we only have like one value in the corner, and then we did like, maybe we replayed that a couple times so we got a few more values along the path and it did a completely different episode, then we like and like maybe we get stuck in a loop, but like as long as we like maybe hit 
states that we like already have a sense of the value that we can continue to update. Yeah, that basically that's the key. Yeah. At once, as soon as you hit a state for which you have a better estimate, that will update the state you just came from. Right? So that's how the. That's so how the, would it ever be the case that you want to just like terminate? Early? Like in this example, for it, like maybe you don't want to like spend too much time just like aimlessly wandering, and you want to just get to a state that you already have an estimate of, and then like you know backtrack and like update the past. Yeah, it's a little hard. How do you get there? How do you get to a state that you already have an estimate? I think when it happens, and then when you like realize that like. The, value of the next state is not zero, then you can like say, okay, stop doing that. We're, not, we're gonna treat that as like one episode instead of like waiting to get to the end. Like would that speed up? No, I don't know. I have to think about that. Think about that. So um, yeah, as as far as the reinforcement learning algorithm itself is concerned, right, you, you have to think of it as very myopic and very just focused on states, rewards, estimates and that it just doesn't have any knowledge beyond that very focused. It doesn't have the idea of where it's trying to go, anything like that. Now, you can keep track of things like what states have I updated recently, for example. That's a, that's a very reasonable thing to do. And you could even maybe run through your replay and say, I just updated a state recently. Is there a state prior to that which I could update from my replay? We're getting far down the path, though. Because right now, in this chapter, we're really myopic. And in this chapter, we're just one step myopic. So like, to me, uh, is this more used when you have like, uh, more often when you like, get a reward on like, every action versus like, like just like, eventually you get a reward? So like, if you have like, uh, negative ones until you got the one, would this then be better than the one color because you're doing it each time? Actually, the negative one, right, because this is another way to format this problem, is as negative one on every step and zero when you escape, right? Let's just look at what would happen here, right? You would start here, maybe you go to the right. What would this state get updated to? Negative one. Okay. From here, would you want to go left? No, because these guys are zero. Let me back up a second. We don't have that knowledge. That's part of the model. Forget that for a moment, OK? So right right now, we're just in this state. And we have no idea what actions lead to where. So, so I was, I was, I was, I was uh, less myopic than I should have been. So I'm in this state. So what do I do? Let's say I happen to go left, OK? What would I update the value of this state to? Negative two, because this guy was already negative one, and it cost us negative one to get there. So that's a negative two. So we will fairly quickly learn that stuff here is high negativity. And we'll eventually try and move out of the high negativity into lower negativity. Okay? Because what we won't do is from here go right. Okay? Because we know that's negative two. And we know the any other options, our Q values are, uh, if we looked at our Qs, are zero. So we would prefer to do a zero. So in this particular case, that would probably work quite well for TD. So not to like get too ahead, but like when you update your policies in this, do you not necessarily have to finish the episode to do so? No. Like, no. no. You, this could be enough to update your policy if you're greedy. So that's another advantage of the Monte Carlo, right, is you can be updating your policy, you can be always be using the latest and greatest policy. Sorry? That's an advantage of TD. That's an advantage of TD. Yes. The other thing about the Monte Carlo is if you did the negative one, negative one, does the Monte Carlo care? It's happy to just screw around here in the lower left, just getting negative ones and negative ones and negative ones and negative ones. And it's only if it randomly gets up here that it'll eventually end the episode. And then it'll learn, wow, this is bad state. Um, I believe in the meeting I mentioned that TD was beneficial when you have really, really large uh, state spaces. Could you give, I am more confused on why it would be, could you give an example, perhaps? This is 
I'm trying to think. I don't remember that quote, and I can't think of why TD in particular is good for large state spaces. Uh, was it only large state spaces? Then just because it's hard to reach a terminal space or hard to reach a terminal space. Oh. Yeah, I guess that. Yeah, that that's certainly a reason. So if 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 you only have one terminal state, then it could take a long, long time to reach that probabilistically. So yeah, it's that. That is certainly an advantage. There's nothing in both of these. We're still using this tabular method where we're keeping this entire table of our Q values. And so yeah, we're no better and no worse in either one of those. And since you don't have to run through the whole episode every time, um, could you just iterate through each square in this case? And just like a nested for loop and just run all the possible conditions? If you knew, oh, you have to know the states to do that. Well, yeah, you have to know the states. Maybe we do know that. Maybe we know the states, um, but you also. I'm not sure exactly what the iteration is that, that we'd be doing, and so really we do have this exploration we still need to do. Our, our assumption with this model free is the only way to find information about the environment is take actions. And usually, we want to minimize the interaction that we have to do with the environment. Okay? So if we can do something simulated on the computer, some simulated environment, that can be relatively cheap. But if you actually have to interact with things in the real world, like a real robot, you know, that takes time and also usually takes money as well. Daniel, you had a question. Um, moving through the states would be uh, that would just be DB, right? Or that Whipping through the states along with the probabilities of the states and those oh, rewards yeah, would, be would be DP. So you'd still need that for the DP. Right. So. Okay. All right. Um, both Monte Carlo and TD converge. The problem is they converge to different differently. <laughs> like to different values or just differently to the same? Different values. Uh, what? What? You say, how is that useful? Yes, uh, I mean, I come up with an algorithm that I also say converges. It converges to zero. How's that? Not good. Let me explain why. Let's say you know let me give an example and then we'll come back. So let's say we have uh, some episodes. Okay, there are two states. Uh, and we just have one action, okay? So I'm not even going to show the action. So this is one episode. And then we have, let's say, B, uh, we have six of these. And we have two of these. Okay. What's our estimate, or Monte Carlo estimate uh, of B and of A? Who's next up on our list? Shannon. Let's start with A. We've only seen it shown once. I agree with that. Um, the net result for that episode was zero. Yes. So this is going to be the average of zero 
which equals zero. Does everyone agree? And what about for B? You're on a roll. Uh, sorry, I'm going to give one of these. It'll make the numbers easier. We know it's going to be an average. Say again? Six and zero. So we have six ones. And, and we have a zero here, and we have a zero here. So that equals three quarters, right? 0 0.75. If we look at the error in this estimate, it's zero. It's like perfect. It exactly describes this test data. Now, we're assuming we have a Markov decision process underneath this. Let's look at what that Markov decision process is. Our best estimate of what it looks like. OK? So, Owen, we have a Markov decision process. Tell me about it. And I'll, oh. I'll write up a diagram. What are the states? A and B. A and B and what else? Uh, yeah, terminal. Uh, what connections do we have between these? So, like A to B and B to Okay, A to B. What's our reward? Um, zero. What's our probability? One. Yeah. I'm just going to put a percent to make it clear its probability. All right. Uh, this is, our, I mean, we couldn't say anything other than zero for our reward, right, according to the data. And we couldn't say anything other than 100%. Now, it may be that the real MDP is zero with 50% of the time and 1,000 with 50% of the time. Could that be? Yes. Sure, that is consistent, but our maximum likelihood is this one, right? That's, that's the, the I, I guess what we could say is the um, um, Occam's razor of MDPs, given our data, would be this. Now keep going, Vaughn. So like then B to T. B to T. And the uh, reward would be uh, when could be 0 or 1. And oh, how are we going to do could be 0 or 1? Fine, two arrows. So zero. And zero would be like uh, 25%. And? One is 25%. This is our max likelihood estimate of the underlying MDP, okay, based on the data. Do it. Does everyone agree with that? This is what TD uh, will estimate. Now, what do I mean this will estimate? TD does not estimate an MDP. TD estimates values. So what is the value of B? I'm not skipping you, Matt. You're not here, right? All right, Dave, what's the value of B? Um, we, do you have the same discount factor? No discount factor. No discount factor, so we'll just do 0 0.75. 0 0.75, right? According to the same, I'm, I am telling you TD is going to get to here, but we're uh, evaluating based on this, on this uh, MDP. So that's 75, and then what about the value of A, according to the MDP? Also same thing, right? Because we get an immediate zero plus a non-discounted 0.75. This is what TD is going to get to. Well, we can look at that in a moment as to why. 
Okay? But basically, if you imagine going through these episodes, but if these are all the episodes we got, then B is going to be updated and assume we have some step size here. You can see how B, given all these, is going to end up at 0.75, right? No? It feels odd to me to be discussing about convergence when we only have like seven episodes. The convergence is... So, I would actually say let's say they estimate different values. Okay? So along the way, they're different. Eventually, this was really not great. So eventually they will converge to the same values, but along the way they have different values. So in Monte Carlo is going to say, give me the best values that match our training data. This is our training data. TD will give us the values that best approximate an MDP, which theoretically generalizes better. Right? If this is the underlying MDP, it's going to generalize better. We're going to see some A's that give us a reward of 1. I just want to quickly point out, and then we need to leave, the A is going to update and say zero reward and 0.75 for the value of B. So we can see how the TD is going to get there. And the Monte Carlo with this data never will. Over time with the Monte Carlo, as we do more and more episodes, it's going to get some episodes to go A0, B1, right? A0, B1. But until it sees those, it's going to give it zero likelihood, so to speak. But if that's the first episode and your like, initial like, estimate would be in zero, then it would only be able to update A, update A once based on that first episode, so we wouldn't have the value. It's true. We would, depending on the order you go through, we wouldn't have that value. Let's just imagine we run through these things three or four or five times. We see, we see these episodes repeated ten times. I don't know, something, something like that. You're right. We could just like, do the TD replay, right? We could do the TD replay, yes. I'll be in the cafe until about 3.15. Um, and otherwise, see you on Monday. Good luck on your exam.